Estátuas e cofres de parentes pintadas Ninguém sabe o que aconteceu hum, Ela se jogou na janela do quinto andar Nada fácil de entender É só o vento lá fora. How did How did, how did music come to your life? Uh, man, I had a friend in school that that uh, he was a guitar player, and I was just fascinated by it. He was the coolest kid in school because he had been out of the country, and like you know, most people I went to school with didn't leave the state. You know, a lot of them are still still there. You know, South Carolina is not a place you ventured out from too far. <laughs> so he had been to Africa and all these cool places. So I was just like, I hung around that guy and wanted to learn how to play the guitar. He helped me learn some things, but um, I just I you know, played piano so I could read music okay and figure stuff out. But it was mostly just darking around with it and figuring songs out. If I ask you, what's the biggest song in your life? Biggest song? Like, that's a difficult question. Uh, I like Paisophilias, man. I honestly do. That song Pies touches Pies? me. Yeah. The words of that song is just uh, has a lot of meaning. Cool. What are we here, man? We're in uh, my California postage stamp sized backyard. I got my plants over there, some tomatoes and zucchinis. I try to do a little gardening, you know. You do? I do what I you can. You like the space. backyard? Yeah, I like it. Makes back you here. feel like, you know, easy. I can get away from the wife for a minute, you know. She'll <laughs> let me sit out here with a cigar and a glass of wine. I can think up good ideas. Like so, where did you grow up? Uh, South Carolina. I, I was born in Georgia, but I grew up in South Carolina. I left there when I was 20. I've been here for 18 years. How were you a ki as a kid? Uh, I was a misfit, man. I, uh, I <laughs> didn't do great in school, and I was always kind of focused on other stuff. And so, I um, tried my hand at, at a startup when I was 19. And I, was too, uh, I was too young to know any better. Let me get this guitar here, yeah. Fraser. I thought I'd give it a... Just a, just a rocker. I thought I'd give it a chance and uh, kind of went from there. You know, that moved me out to California ultimately and the technology was a, a lot more happening here than it was in South Carolina. So I've been stuck here since. How did you come to California? How did you come to Silicon Valley? I, you know, when I uh, started the ISP, it was an internet service provider in South Carolina that, uh, you know, failed, but along the way I met some people over the internet. Not many people were using the internet in 1992 or 93, whenever that was. And uh, so these guys knew how to build networks and all, so they were the people that I gravitated towards. And back then it was Usenet. I mean, anything that, if you wanted to get, you know, good data, get access to good information, there was no web. I mean, we weren't using web browsers yet. Uh, so it was all Usenet groups on you know networking or alt.net and whatever. So uh, so I talked to some people through that and I made some friends and they said, hey, the economy is doing great in California, you know, and if you've got skills to build an ISP, like come on out. So I moved out to California. I worked for what then was you know the biggest ISP that I had ever heard. I was called Netcom, started by a guy uh, Robert Hood and somebody you'll be meeting next week. Jay Adelson was a very early employee there at Netcom. So a lot of those people just splintered off and did great things. So I was lucky, you know, I was in the right place at the right time, and cool, just, I was right? just fascinated by networking. Cool. Uh, how's the story that I've heard that you're supposed to go for army or supposed to go for? Oh man, yeah. What is that? Yeah, I, you know, because my grades weren't great in school, you know, I just I couldn't sit down and focus and do do homework and all. I was kind of busy trying to do other things, and and so I, this was an opportunity that came up, if you want to call it an opportunity. I, I still kind of think it would have been cool to try to be a pilot or something, but. Uh, I, uh, I went and enlisted in the Air Force, you know, one of these overly aggressive recruiters that somehow they know the problem kids out there, like, yeah, this kid didn't, his grades weren't too good, he's not making it into college. I'll go <laughs> knock on his door, see if I can get him to join the Air Force. And so, I, you know, I, I did the ASVAB, what the test was called, you know, the acceptance test or whatever, and like, you know, it kind of scores you and they tell you, oh yeah, you'll be a pilot or whatever. And so, uh, you know, the last thing you do is you go and you talk to the, the medic, you know, the doc, and. He asks you a bunch of questions, and the recruiter, the Air Force recruiter, I'm sure the Army and the Marines do the same thing. They say, if he asks you anything, say no. Like, if he asks you if you've ever sneezed, you say no. 
And I said, yeah, okay, like I guess that's, they just want to shovel you in the door and he gets, I don't know what he gets, maybe they get a, some kind of payout or something for bringing people into the Air Force. Hey, we have a visit here. Yeah, right? I got a little visitor. Visitor. Uh, this is Pearl, named after the programming language. The, uh, I don't know if he still lives here, but Larry Wall, the guy that invented the language, lives two streets over. That'd be funny if she wandered into his yard, you know, and it's like, hey, lost dog, and they scan the, the RFID, and it's like, his name's Pearl. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, you know, I went to the medic, and the guy asked me all the questions. Have you ever had a concussion? Have you ever blacked out? Yeah, all that stuff, skateboarding, you know. I just said, no, no, no. And he asked me, he said, are you, uh, are you allergic to anything? And I kind of chuckled, and he's like, what are you chuckling about? And I said, oh, I'm allergic to wool, but nothing else. And he's like, all right, you're out. And I was frozen for a moment. I was like, what does that mean? I'm out. He's like, you're out. He said, literally, in these words, you can bleep this out if you want. All of our shit is wool. He had not another second for me. It was just, that was it. He was on to the next guy. And so I was on the street corner in Charlotte, North Carolina, not a, literally not a dime to my name. And I asked this woman walking down the street for a quarter, because you could use a, you know, a quarter and, and pick up a payphone and call somebody. Okay. And I called my father, who had dropped me off. You know, I was like, hey, man, I didn't make it. Sorry. And he was pissed. And he was angry. It's like, why not? I'm like, I'm allergic to wool. He's like, why'd you tell him you're allergic to wool? I didn't think it would matter, you know? <laughs> so that changed the course of my life, you know? Because right so, after whoa. that. Being allergic to wool. Yeah. I'm uh, here because made of sheep. You, because of sheep, right? Yeah. <laughs> so made you an entrepreneur. Have you ever thought about being an entrepreneur before you start? I, I probably couldn't have even spelled entrepreneur when I started the ISP. I just knew that I wanted to be part of the internet and I thought everyone would be excited about this cool thing called the internet because you know it's going to be this great new medium that everyone's going to use. Everything you buy, every, you know, all this stuff I was thinking about and I just I wanted to be part of it. Not because I wanted to, you know, I didn't think there was a lot of money and I was going to get rich. I just wanted to, to participate and build part of this network. So that's uh, that's what drove it, and then after a while, I realized, like I guess you know, kind of starting a business and going out on a limb in tech is a little bit of an entrepreneur. Uh, okay, let's talk about Badgeview. Badgeview was the first big shot that you gave, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I tried a few uh, companies along the way, but Badgeview is uh, is one that did pretty well. I mean, they're still doing really well. So, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, have you failed before Badgeview? Yeah, I mean, not. Uh, you know, the ISP, when I was young, was probably the worst failure because I really bet, you know, the, the farm on it, so to speak. But, uh, you know, I'd done a couple of companies along the way that, uh, you know, didn't go anywhere, but it wasn't like I had invested everything in it. You know, and the cloud has brought about a lot of these startups. It's like, hey, I'm going to do this on the side, and if it gets traction, then I'll run with it. So, um, so I, yeah, it's probably not, uh, probably not a bigger failure than, than the ISP when I was young. But... I've worked in small companies and some of those have failed. And what about Badger? How did it came? Like, yeah, uh, in life? Uh, Max, you know, my son went to a, a preschool with uh, Chris Duggan's kid. And so uh, we have a mutual friend who's a, a plastic surgeon in Palo Alto. And he said, hey, I got a friend who, you know, he wants to do a startup and he's a business guy and you're, you know, he needs a tech guy. And I said, sure, I'll talk to him. You know, I, our kids had gone to school together, but I didn't know him. And so we met and we kicked around a few startup ideas. Uh, one we wanted to call PayBump. It's like using your phone and bumping payments to people. Hmm. Like a month later, PayPal announced a product called PayBump where you bump your phone and make payments to people. Right. So it's a good thing we didn't run with that one. But this was Chris's idea. He wanted to do a gamification platform. And you know, because of experience I had at Opinions long ago where we kind of we drove user behavior by giving them some kind of status and reputation. I knew that it could work, you know, on a big scale. So, sure. so we uh, we ran with it, and fortunately, it panned out. How is this uh, starting code uh, for a thing that is an idea, and you have no clue if it's going to be something good or not? Uh, you gotta you gotta find ways to test it, man. You gotta find ways to test it on an audience. You know, Eduardo brought up something the other day that was really good. You know, ghetto testing. Where if you've got an audience to begin with, you put a banner up that says, hey, check out this new product, and people click on it. It's an email registration form where, you know, sign up to get updates about, you know, the progress of this or, you know, to be in our early beta program. And you just test the waters. How are people going to react? You know, Chris and I would take a laptop in the back of his truck, and literally our product was a PowerPoint slide at that point. Uh -huh. And we would meet with people like the Palo Alto Mothers Group, and they're like, yeah, I don't think uh, moms want to be competitive, and blah, blah, blah. And like... They were probably our strongest, most competitive demographic, but but you still you try to get you know get word back from people and find cool. out. And tell us the story. So then you guys start the company. Uh, 
And how did it go? Yeah, I mean, uh, it went, uh, we picked up some pilot customers, you know, that helped a lot. We got a lot of good feedback, you know, we had our share of problems. Uh, you know, things broke down and just, uh, you know, we actually had uh, some customers with a lot of traffic. And so we, uh, you know, we did okay. And by the time we, we went to TechCrunch Disrupt in 2010, uh, by the time we got on stage, we had made money. You know, we were we were like a profitable company. Mm. And so we had we had made the most money. We might have been the only one that had made any money out of the last 25 competitors. And we had taken the smallest amount of investment. And so I think that helped a lot. You know, we got the, uh, we won the audience was choice like award. Was seed funding on that time? Yeah. And so we... How uh, much was it? About 250K. Okay. So we, uh, you know, we won the audience choice award at, at TechCrunch. And after that, you know, it was just the floodgates were open. People were calling like crazy. So sure. we, we had to do a round of funding just to answer the phone calls. Oh, cool. Uh, how did the funding, like, uh, became, like, after the seed money? How was the time for everything? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, really, about three or four months after seed, you know, was, was TechCrunch. And then uh, we did our A in late 2010, early 2011. It went in early 2011. And Maynard Webb led that. He runs Web Investment. Now. And how much was that? That was two and a half. Two and a half. And uh, then we did another round about eight, ten months later for uh, 12 and a half. And then our C was in uh, early 2012 for uh, 25 million. So, oh, 25 minutes. So, around 40 million total. Yeah. Not bad. <laughs> yeah, it went quickly. I mean, we were scaling out. Uh, in like crazy three rate. years or not even? Yeah. Wow. Uh, and how is the, the company going so far? It's going really well. I mean, uh, you know, we got lucky. We landed some really flagship customers, a lot of Fortune 500. And, uh, you know, all the use cases that came out of it, you know, just test your idea out, find out, you know, people are going to use it in different ways. And sometimes there's even a, a new product that will shape uh, out of that. So you, you guys succeed. Uh, when you think about innovation, uh, on the time you were like thinking about a company and then you thought about gamification and then it, you have to think about innovation, right? So uh, when, when you're in that point and you have to choose, are we being innovative in product, process or business model? You had that time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you, we uh, we kind of adhered to a lot of the new emerging protocols and standards, you know, like, uh, you know, agile methodologies and you, know, you read up on what's out there because, you know, the company grew quickly and it can get out of hand easily if you don't have some kind of structure in place. So uh, I think you've got to be innovative across the board. Uh, but there is stuff out there to help you. I mean, there are good guidelines and there are good, uh, there are good practices that you can follow and help you along. So then you think you guys were more innovative in the product, process, or business model? Uh, God, I, it'd be tough to pick one. I, you know, the market, we had to, the challenge was we had to teach the market what gamification was. And we didn't like the word at all because it sounded like, I'm going to put a video game on your website. You know, and is IBM going to use that for their internal employees? Probably not. And that wasn't what we wanted to build. We wanted to drive user behavior and change the way people do things and, and get results from that and be able to, you know, to, to learn from that and then monitor and adjust. So, uh, so it was innovative in that you know, it, no one was really doing it. There were a couple of companies in the space before, but we had to kind of adjust and, and take on enterprise customers and find good use cases and steer the product. Um, so I think processes, you know, as, say from an engineering perspective, I don't think we pioneered any space. We didn't say, here's a new standard of how you write code and work in a team you know, of developers. But, uh, but the product was certainly innovative. Okay. How is it after you, you become a successful entrepreneur and then you tell people, you know, I built a company, we raised $40 million. So what changed in you as a person after that? God, man, a lot. It was quite a learning experience. Um, you, you think about yourself and how you've conducted business and how you work with others and all, and like, what could I have done differently and how could I change? I mean, there are a lot of takeaways. I couldn't even put my finger on one that's the most, but uh, yeah, I tend to be a little more passive when it comes to uh, running a company, and so. Uh, you know, Chris is the, he's the outgoing guy and, you know, he's got his dream and he's like, we're going to do things this way. I tend to go, well, let's, uh, you know, let's see how things go and, and, uh, and go with the flow. 
But sometimes you can't be like that, man. Sometimes you gotta be a little more aggressive and pushy. And, and if you feel like something should be done the way it should be done, you, you push for it and fight for it and make it happen. And you, you, you think like you're behaving different now? As a person, I, I don't think so. Let's go back a little bit before I talk about your new project and new startup. Let's go back a little bit and say you've came here. You've come here. In, you've came here in 1992? 95. 95? So 18 years? 18 years. Okay, from 18 years to now, what was the biggest change in Silicon Valley? Oh man, uh, God, the first wave was pretty incredible. Uh, I use this analogy today. You know, the first wave was like, I'm, I'm going to sell shoes online and, and investors are throwing money at you and you've got crazy valuations and you know, no one really knew what the limit of, of of what it could be, how much money could you generate, what kind of revenue could you get from selling shoes online. So there was a lot of hype, you know, and there were a lot of crazy decisions that went into some of these investments. So anything online was, was generating a whole lot of, you know, startup capital and buzz, you know, a lot of hype. Uh, after everything fell apart you know, around 2000, 2001, there was a very noticeable difference in Silicon Valley, man. It was restaurants weren't crowded anymore and the, the wait staff got a little friendlier because they needed your business you know uh, you know apartment complexes that said hey I want to see that you've got a hundred thousand dollars in your bank account before we'll rent to you had people on the street you know holding up signs going please rent from us you know so it was hard to have sympathy for this guy so you know, people were really taking advantage of uh, what was going on here but it, you know the bottom fell out it was a, it was a crazy time you know a lot of people lost their jobs i, I heard something like 75,000 people moved out of the bay area in 2000 wow so it was a, it was a dark time man. it was very different you know, compared to what i found when i arrived here in 95 there was just so much buzz and everyone around me was talking about technology and all this stuff that you know no one was uh, talking about at home in south carolina so it's uh, so the second wave is interesting it's it's not all based on hype, but there is a there is some aspect to it where you know a lot of companies are saying, oh, we're doing this in the cloud, you know, and SaaS has become cloud by by nature of the fact that it's running on cloud compute resources. And people are throwing a lot of investment money at companies just because they say, oh, we're a cloud company and you know, we're selling insurance in the cloud. Right. Uh, so there's a little bit of that silliness still, but uh, but I think a lot of you know, we got a lot of wiser investors and people are being a lot more practical where they're placing their bets. Uh, so it's it's a cool time. It's a really cool time, and the cloud has made a, you know it's paved the way for a lot of entrepreneurs to you know test the waters. What's the next wave? Oh man, it's something along the lines of biotech or augmented reality. I mean, I think things are going to continue to go more and more mobile. Let's go for your new startup now. Yeah. You just say augmented reality, so jump apart, right? Sure. Yeah. We, uh, you know, it's Marco Venosi and John Francois Katz and myself. Uh, you know, I've known these guys for a long time. Marco was like an image recognition guru, uh, really good with mobile devices and C. I build out back-end platforms, and JFC is an all-around you know product guy slash marketing. He's a bit of a coder, although he'd never admit it. So we make a we make a pretty good team. We cranked out a product really quickly with the vision of you know we want to be the next platform that all AR apps use to layer you know, media on top of physical content. So. Uh, yeah, that, that was a dream, and we put it together pretty quickly in November last year, you know, a nice little prototype, and we started testing the waters with it to see how people were rea react, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of good comments, a lot of good feedback, and so we decided at some point, like, we, we just decided to go with it. And how is it now? Like, uh, what's the next step? Are you going for seed money? Are you going for... Yeah, we're working on a round right now, uh, mostly angels. There are a few people, just kind of friends and contacts within, uh, you know, the VC space that I'd like to uh, you know, get on board for strategic reasons, but uh, so we hope to close that out in about two weeks. Two weeks? So it's coming. Yeah. Hands on, it's going to help that. <laughs> All right, that'd be great. <laughs> so uh, the vision for this is that uh, you're going to change the way people see content? Yeah, so uh, you know, my, my long-term vision is that you know, wearables will be everywhere. You know, everyone will have a pair of glasses. Uh, probably side projection technology so you can actually overlay you know walls and buildings and billboards with you know media it could be video or still images or you know sound or something to buy web pages so we wanted to build the technology that would allow that to happen 
So for now, uh, what we're doing with our platform is building one-off kind of game applications for big brands. So uh, you know you can find special promotions within our ads if you use your phone and check into a radio station. So we do sound recognition, video recognition. You can point to a TV commercial and get some special offer for you. Uh, collect a bunch of game pieces to win a prize. What's the most biggest challenge now that you're like building this new company? Uh, I don't like to be the face man. I'm, I'm not a CEO kind of guy, so I kind of like to fill that role sooner than later. Uh, you know, it's, we don't have a burning need right now, but I can I can envision six months down the road. It'd be really nice to have somebody to run the business side of things and can be the evangelist and the and the face man. So that, that's probably the big challenge that we're working on right now. And uh, that's that's interesting. You have three co-founders, and no of them wants to be the CEO. Yeah. Wow. That's. So, so you're going to hire a CEO? And yeah, at some point we'll hire a CEO. The CEO is not going to be, it's going to be an executive, right. professional CEO. Yeah. It's very interesting. Like, I've seen a lot of people with other problems, right? They have three people and then well, all of them all went CEOs, to be the CEO. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're a little different in that regard. And, uh, you know, when I talk to, you know, investor friends, they say, you know, we can definitely help you with that when the time comes and all. So that's... When I say uh, it'd be strategic to get an institutional investor on board, that's that's part of the reason. Okay, uh, have you thought about the, the monetization part? Yeah, I mean, we've got a pretty good strategy for that. It's it's uh, We've got a back end that can support a lot of cool features, and we've got gamification elements, you know, we've got an engine for that, and that can talk to all, all of these uh, you know, neat AR components within the mobile apps. So we're, uh, we're at approaching big brands and going through agencies and doing you know, big campaigns for them using bleeding edge technology. So uh, you know, we hope to be part of every agency's pitch deck, you know, a technology like this so they can go to brands and build these interesting campaigns. We've talked with uh, a lot of venture capitals and now we're doing the cashing in show as you know. And uh, we always have these questions to them like scale, market and profit. If we put all these three words together, and uh, like for for gel papyrus, how do you see these three words? Yeah, so I mean, the market isn't there for my long-term dream. We don't all have wearables yet, so you know the market I think will will keep emerging, and we'll we'll have to do these one-off applications until that time comes. Uh, but there's definitely money to be made, and I mean, there's definitely profit to be made in doing these you know, complex, sophisticated campaigns that are really engaging for these brands. Um, platform and, and uh, that side of scaling is you know, that's, that's our forte, so we've got no problem there. It's all about market readiness and, and you know, business model. Very good, Wedge. Uh, you, of course, know a lot of stories here in the in the Silicon Valley, right? Can you like? share with us a couple of them interesting uh, Silicon Valley story without incriminating anyone <laughs> um, I think so yeah there were a lot of uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff that went on in the late 90s man people just uh, you know sleeping under their desks and all you, there was a book written uh, I forget the author it was called the nudist on the night shift and about literally some guy like an ops person that would uh, you know come to work naked and just anything anything would go back then it was just uh, it was a crazy place and crazy time uh, you know probably uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, Bob Rieger who was uh, the co-founder of Netcom he threw a chair through a conference room window once because you know back in those days there wasn't a cloud so you had data centers for everything. If you wanted a presence on the internet, you had to know how to build stuff out, provision the electricity, buy the servers, rack them, and that was your, your web company, you know? I mean, things have changed a lot. So our ISP literally ran out of the same building we worked in. It was on the mezzanine floor. And so the downstairs floor had electricity, and we didn't. And Bob saw the shortest path to electricity, picked up a conference room chair, chucked it through the window. It landed in front of the building where people are walking in and out of the, you know, the, the main lobby. Wow. Just threw it, didn't look, plugged the electricity in, and, and kept going. Brought the company back online, and, and that's you know, how we did it. Wow, that's a funny story. <laughs> that's a good story, man. He's that's a, wild a good character. That's that's a story that you go. It don't matter what you have to do. 
But you have to do it, right? Yeah, I, I, I really respect that drive in somebody. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about, how, how, how are you when you think about family and friends? Yeah, you gotta have a balance. It's, uh, you know, startup life is difficult to, to stay in touch with your friends and, you know, have time, leisure time and relax and I'll be, you have to keep it in check. I mean, just for your, your mental health, you know, you do, you do burn out and, and anyone can burn out. You know, developers, there's a bell curve of productivity, you know, you have to step away sometimes and recharge. But I think that's extremely important. What would you suggest for the people who are watching us and they don't live in Silicon Valley? But of course, uh, we are trying to give them this mindset, this spirit of collaboration of Silicon Valley. What would you suggest to them to be in touch with this kind of energy, with this kind of atmosphere? I would say find a community, find some community online and participate in it, you know, get involved and you know, just travel around, go to conferences and all. But I mean, there's, there's a lot of good collaboration that can be done remotely. You know, a lot of companies, you look at IBM, you know, something like 30% of their workforce is, is remote. So, you know, being here is, is uh, it's incredible and it's, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, it's the place to be. But, uh, you know, you can maintain a, a base here and, and be remote and all. Um, I think the spirit is, you know, share information. You know, there's a very, it's, it's a club here, it's a small community. You know, a lot of people will go and talk about their ideas with people in a restaurant and, no one's worried about, hey, some guy's going to steal my idea. Why? Because you know somebody that knows that guy. And if he does do that, he's going to you know, scar his name here permanently. So, you know, people uh, just have an open open approach to talking about startups and ideas here. Uh, short questions to short answers, okay? All right. United States. The United States. Do I think it's the epicenter of technology? No. This is a hot spot, but uh, there's a lot of hot spots happening everywhere. People? People, man, people make the difference. You know, a lot of companies, you've heard the term aqua hire, but it, it's the people that make things happen. And make sure you're with the right people when you start out. Uh, family? Keep family in balance. Family has to be part of it. If you don't have their support, you're not going to succeed. Music? I don't know if it's for everyone, but it keeps me going, and it's, it's part of my therapy. What's hands-on for you? Hands-on is uh, it's a great concept. It's it, what I tell everyone. Like, if you want to learn something, you dig in. You, you go and do that thing. Cool. Hey, uh, we start with music, and now <laughs> we finish with music. What about that? All uh -huh. right. Sure. Sure. Okay. What are we gonna play? Uh, I don't know. Let's play some. What uh, do you? I like the I like what we was we were listening to a second ago. Was it? Are you gonna sing? Let's go. Let's just start, let's just start, let's go again. Oh, where, oh, where can my baby be? The Lord took her away from me. She's gonna have a soul, I've got to be good. So I can see my baby when I leave this world. Martin, ladies and gentlemen, I'll see you next round. Thanks, right. Reg. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll see you next round.